Hi, everyone. I'm excited to introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Gonzalo gonzalez Abad. Um, Gonzalo is an atmospheric researcher at the Center for Astrophysics, he graduated with a bachelor in physics from the University of Valencia in 2008, and a PhD in chemistry from the University of York in 2011. He joined the Center for Astrophysics, which is a collaboration between the Harvard College Observatory and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow upon completing his PhD. Uh, and in 2014, he became a staff physicist at the C Center for Astrophysics uh, in the Atomic and Molecular Physics Division. A fun fact is the pristine nature of his hometown uh, in Spain inspired Gonzalo to pursue research connected to the preservation of our planet and understanding the Earth system. And today he specializes in space-based remote sensing of atmospheric compositions. We're excited to have him here with us today. And Gonzalo, I will let you take the lead now. Okay, thank you, Erika. Thank you, uh, Emma and company for having me. It is a pleasure to try to explain a bit about uh, air quality uh, and how we measure it. So first, let me share my screen. Start my presentation. Bring it into presentation mode. Do you see it as I hope you see it. Yes, it looks good. Excellent. Uh, okay, so good uh, morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I I was asked to try to provide an overview of how we measure air quality and atmospheric composition for such end uh, in all different regimes. So what this presentation and this webinar is trying to do is to provide like a global overview of the capabilities that we have uh, to do that and before going into the details of the different uh, ways to measure air quality I want to provide a small introduction to to why we worry about this and I guess you know because you are involved with the ocean gardens but I, I always try to keep my introductions uh, spin so ho hopefully you have a bit of fun with it so with that said uh, i want to provide a very short history of air pollution uh, we we think about it uh, as a problem as a contemporary problem but the truth is that uh, it uh, it was an issue well before um so in 2016 at the Smithsonian Magazine, and in this link, you can visit the, the history that, that, that they published there. Uh, I hope you now see my web, my web browser. Uh, basically, this uh, little article was kind of going through a few uh, situations in which in antiquity, they, they experienced terrible uh, air quality. And uh, I don't know, I think maybe it was Seneca. I don't remember now. Um, but uh, he kind of complained about the fumes of Rome and uh, how he had to to escape the city to breathe uh, nice air. So as you see, this has been a problem that has been with us for a while. And since I like a lot art and uh, I'm from Spain, I, I don't know how much you know about uh, Spanish painters, but one of the greatest is Diego Velázquez, um, which is, uh, you know, the Baroque period. Sometimes some people call it the Golden Age, but I think by that time the Golden Age was gone. Anyway, he was a great painter. Um, and uh, he has this paint that I like a lot, which is the Forge of Vulcano, in which you can see some people here. Uh, oh, let me bring my pointer, I think. Yeah, here uh, you, you see the, you know, them working on building some weapons, uh, which of course it has always been a big source of uh, pollution. In this particular painting, it will be indoor pollution, but uh, in here we will talk about outdoor pollution, which is what I work on and what ocean gardens uh, are designed to observe and understand. So, said that about antiquity, it's not the fact that there were some few cases in which, uh, you know, pollution was a problem. I, I think Rome managed to have like more than a million people and and in the 18 in the 
8th century Cordoba in southern Spain had a million people also, so they had some issues. But we really started to uh, dump uh, stuff into the atmosphere with the Industrial Revolution. So I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, curve. Uh, it's always available from the Scripps Institution. It turns out that if I have the, the pointer on, I cannot click on... I didn't know this, sorry. I'm going to exit. Yeah, so here at the Scripps Institution, they maintain this uh, data record of uh, CO in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, if you go very a long time back, they, this is extracted from uh, high scores and other techniques. But uh, if you look at the at this, for example, from going back uh, 800,000 years, it looks like we have been going up and down. But as you see in the last, uh, I don't know, three centuries, we have really outdone ourselves. So anyway, I wanted to introduce this, uh, the killing curve, which is a very graphical way, I think, of showing how much uh, our presence in the planet and our activities are affecting uh, or changing the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, and that kind of brings us uh, to, and, and th that curve was showing, as I say, data for carbon dioxide, which is mostly a greenhouse gas, and that's why we worry about it. But uh, associated with the emissions of carbon, of course, is are uh, all these other compounds that constitute um, Pollution, pollution and our precursors to, um, you know, we, we, they, they, they contribute to the production of ozone and other uh, um, particles. And we knew this also from quite a, for, we've known this for quite a long time. Uh, we have had these smog episodes, which, uh, you know, the photochemistry combined with all these things that we emit, nitrogen dioxide and volatile organic compounds and stuff like that, results in the production of ozone particles. And I, I like this picture, which I couldn't find who, who took it, but uh, it has a, it's quite, it's quite impressive, first because of the thickness that you can see here on the right uh, of the smoke that, took, that was over Los Angeles in, in the 8th of July, 1943. Um, and the second, because on the left, you see this guy with the gas mask. And I I think he was not really, what I read is that he was not really worried about the smoke, but they thought maybe it was a Japanese attack because they were, we were in the middle of the Second World War. So, uh, you know, ILA had this problem for a long time and the country has made huge improvements and now things, the situation is, is better in the US. But in other parts of the world, um, we are where the U.S. was maybe 50 years ago. So this is a picture uh, from Bangkok, um, maybe uh, from three or four years ago. And you can see how bad uh, air pollution is over there. And this has consequences. This has consequences in many aspects. Uh, maybe the most uh, striking one is the number of premature deaths that are attributed to air pollution. Uh, this is an old slide I have, and this number here of 4.2 million has changed. Maybe now, uh, you know, there is a big uncertainty on it, all these calculations, but what is clear is that it's not good for our health to breathe uh, air with high concentrations of ozone or particulate matter or other stuff. And uh, the economic and social impacts of this are massive. But this is only one aspect. Uh, to bring it closer to the ocean gardens, we all know that uh, uh, air pollution, um, for example, ozone has important effects on our ecosystems and also in the uh, effectiveness of our uh, agricultural industry. They can affect, uh, it can affect negatively the the crop uh, yields of uh, 
staple uh, staple crops in the US, but also in other places like in India, where there is a important concern regarding the possibility of you know how much uh, uh, crop yield loss will affect our uh, food security. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but there are several levels in which our production uh, pollution, air quality uh, pollution can affect the physiology of plants and ecosystems. So you can go from the metabolism and the physiology of the leaves uh, and how that affects the whole canopy as a, well, as a whole to how the plant grows because, you know, they are all interconnected and eventually they cut this uh, po the pollution also can affect the ground itself, not only the aerial part of the plants, but also the uh, root systems and the soil itself. So basically the whole ecosystem is sensitive to uh, an unnatural, let's just say, levels of, uh, of pollution. So because of this, um, over the years, there has been an effort to establish guidelines and try to uh, uh, provide uh, information about which levels of uh, pollutants are deemed safe uh, for the population and ecosystem. So this one, for example, is the World Health Organization recommendations. Uh, and what they these, these agencies do usually is to select a few. Uh, there are some uh, compounds or particles that are uh, selected because of their impacts and also because of or understanding of them as uh, the species that we have to monitor. So in this case, the World Health Organization suggests to look, has suggestions for particulate matter at two sizes, 2.5 and 10. This, this number means it's the, the, the size of the particle, so 2.5 microns or 10 microns. And then they have also guidelines for ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. So the, the World Health Organization has been doing this since 2005, but actually the US was uh, quite ahead of the game, I will say, maybe because we have these issues with LA and other cities. And in 1970, when the Clear Cleaner Act was, uh, was uh, first passed, it kind of uh, established uh, the, it was the groundbreaking effort when it came to uh, regulation of how much, air, how, how, how to control air quality and take initiatives to, to manage it. Um, so that was in the 1970s, the, the, the standards get actualized regularly when there is new evidence or new need needs associated with, you know, we have more knowledge about how human health is impacted or, um, or understanding of the chemistry, the chemical processes that result in the formation of some uh, pollutants um, changes, then the standards get uh, updated. This is the last one, the last set of standards. As you can see, compared with the recommendation from the World Health Organization, we have here an, an, another uh, element that was not present in the previous table, which is a lead, um, which I have no idea how, how it is measured. I, this is not my speciality, but uh, we all know that it's very toxic. Yeah. So uh, here in this link down here, you can go to the website where EPA maintains this information and explains a lot of stuff on how this uh, levels can be attained and you know they have protocols to attain them and they work with local and regional uh, agencies to make sure it works and to make this information easier for the public to understand uh, they also develop the an air quality index now there is many of these in the planet um, but the epa one is maybe the one that has a longer history and basically they create a composite of all the observations that they have from uh, all those uh, uh, species that, that define the standards and then they grade it by color. So in 
the EPA has a set of monitors and models that helps them to produce forecasts or reanalysis of the air quality situation. So, for example, I grabbed this map today, uh, this morning when I was finishing the presentation. Uh, that was the situation, uh, I don't know, maybe at 10 a.m. Now, if we click on this uh, on this uh, link, we can go and see what is the situation uh, right now. Do you see my website? Yes, we see yes. that. Excellent. So I click on this on the left. This one will be the forecast. Uh, at the end, I will talk a bit about forecast. But uh, for now, let's just measure, look at what we know because we measure it. So this is uh, publicly available to everybody. And you can just you know, um, go to that link. And EPA puts out these maps. And uh, here, you know, the, the color scale of this, uh, this color scale is now associated with the ozone, but I can also include the ozone monitors, for example. So these are measurements that they are taking place. So their forecast, you can see in some places, kind of agrees well with the, uh, their forecast, their model agrees well with the monitoring monitors, and in other places, not so well. So, and this brings up the question of why we need to continuously measure this stuff. And there's several reasons. Uh, obviously, for an agency like EPA, it is uh, fundamental to, to know what is the, what we have in the air. So we know if uh, the regulations are, we are compliant with the regulation, regulations, and if not, what we can do to the device plans and protocols to become compliant. But we also need these observations to continue to investigate it and understand the chemistry and the dynamics that are behind the way air pollution evolves and changes. And the humongous effort. If you look at this map, it may look like if there is a lot of monitors. So in this one, for example, I'm showing uh, ozone and PM monitors, but if we were to zoom in, um, oh, uh, for example, so here, yeah, this is this is this other website where, sorry, where um, they show all the monitors that the EPA has active now. Now, so these are ground-based observations. EPA maintains these um, stations where they measure all or some of these uh, species that I mentioned before, and they do it in in the ground with instruments that they have uh, approved and calibrated to do it with great precision and accuracy. Uh, and each species uses a different technique. And I'm not an expert on those, but the, all this data is available. So if you go to this website for each one of these monitors, you can click on it and then you can select the species that you want to download and the day, the year, Usually you can get it as a tab in tabulated form, and then you can, uh, you know, do with it whatever you, you need to do. If you want to see if there was a pollution event near one of these, that's something that you can do using this publicly available EPA data. Uh, as I mentioned, each one of these species uses a different technique. So EPA works very hard to establish uh, standards of how to measure these things, and but they are not easy. This is not easy to measure, and, and uh, there is depending which compounds there may be there may be affected by different sources of uncertainty, and the precision may be different from species to species. So, if at some point you are interested in looking at this, I recommend that you try to read, if it is possible, the information that EPA provides associated to each one of the monitors regarding the instruments they use, their strengths and their weaknesses if they have. But as, as I mentioned before, uh, as dense as it looks like the map that I saw before or the one that is in the background here, if we zoom in uh, in an area like you will imagine that is fairly well uh, monitored like uh, New England, Massachusetts, for example, where we are, where I am, um, you know, there is a few uh, 
this, uh, this map is for nitrogen dioxide monitors. There is a few monitors, but not even close to have an idea of what is happening in our neighborhoods. Um, it gives you a broad picture with large gaps. Um, EPA is not the only one that is taking these observations. There is regional um, agencies that also work on this and so you can sometimes access that data. Uh, uh, it becomes not a, you know, EPA has a very easy framework to access its data. So maybe that's the easiest. Uh, and then, but, and then there is now this proliferation of chip sensors. Maybe you are familiar with Purple Air or others that kind of provide um, their data sometimes freely, is freely available to the public. But of course, with the cost effective solutions also come the nuances of uh, lower accuracy and precision. So it's a trade off, yeah. EPA does a great job, it does it in many places, but it's impossible to reach everywhere. So the regional agencies also contribute. And then there is this idea of citizen science and other solutions that uh, can provide some context, but each one has its strengths and its uh, weaknesses. But this is, if we look at air pollution from a regulatory point of view, if we want to know if we are compliant with the um, regulations and if we are not, if we are moving in the right direction and stuff like that. But if what we want to do is to understand the chemical processes that take place in the atmosphere or how they interact with the ecosystems, um, the question gets even more complicated. Yeah. In this slide, I just want to illustrate in a very simple way some of the processes that we need to understand when we want to uh, define policies that may help us to improve air quality, or just yes, simply to understand the chemistry uh, that leads into the production of a secondary pollutant, for example, like ozone, or uh, in the emissions of, uh, from soil uh, associated with agricultural uh, practices. So, of course, we have anthropogenic and natural emissions, um, and we have also the, the, the processes of deposition, dry deposition or wet deposition, when these pollutants that are in the atmosphere come down again to, to Earth. Uh, then we have transport, uh, you know, things move around and there is no boundaries So for air, so uh, it doesn't really matter if the state of uh, it matters, but the state of Maryland can put a regulation, but if the state of a state that is upwind has a different one, then, you know, it has to work, they have to work together. And in this slide, actually, I'm missing what I work on, which is the atmospheric chemistry. So these are like physical processes. And in the middle of this, there is thousands of reactions that are taking place continuously involving thousands of uh, species. So to study this complex system, uh, we need more than just the measurements that are provided by these regulatory agencies. And for that, uh, agencies like NASA, NOAA, NSF, and others put together very interesting experiments and campaigns uh, to study specific processes or problems. So this slide, for example, I just get a bit from NOAA. It shows, uh, you know, it's like an artistic impression of a set of campaigns that took place last summer. Uh, the idea was that by the time these campaigns were taking place, Tempo, is the satellite we work with, um, was going to be already up there and measuring. So we could not only benefit from the picture that Tempo will provide, but also help to understand how well Tempo is doing. So in these campaigns, Assets that assets involve ground observations, aircraft, they put sensors in aircrafts and fly them around so you can get information at different altitudes. And they also have ground remote sensing that can provide some information about the vertical distribution of pollutants. And, and we have, as I say, also our space-based remote sensing 
part, which is in this case illustrated by tempo, but we also have low Earth satellites. So these are huge efforts involving hundreds of scientists that use um, many different uh, techniques to measure from aerosols to um, clouds to gas phase or IQ phase, uh, so IQ phase uh, species. And all this data usually becomes available uh, after, you know, the scientists have had time to uh, process and use the final product. Uh, and it depends which campaign you can get access to it through NASA websites or NOAA websites. Um, there is this NASA sites called Guess Disc or ASDC. They are like archives that specialize in providing this sort of information. However, working with this data, I find it is not as easy as it is to work with the one I saw before, because to understand what is happening, you, you need to have more uh, specialized analysis techniques, you know, because they are very specific. And before we were talking about five or six species, now we are talking maybe about a hundred or 200 species. And depending on what you want to study, it's, uh, you know, you need to look at one or the other. So this is the picture that we can get from this uh, multidisciplinary combining many different asset campaigns. And because I work on space-based remote sensing, I want to kind of finish by uh, focusing on the image we can get from space, uh, which covers some of the gaps that these other techniques have. These other techniques are very valuable and actually provide us with very accurate and precise, observa precise observations um, they give us concentrations on the surface or at different altitudes. So remote sensing from space cannot do that. And from remote sensing from space, we usually get one piece of information, maybe total column or sometimes some, pro some sort of profile. But in general, it comes with a fair, a fair amount of uncertainty. And the accuracy is also you know, difficult to characterize. But what we have is continuous observations of a large areas in this map for example i saw the difference in between pre-covid and after covid uh, of the nitrogen dioxide as seen by tropomi uh, which is a low earth orbit satellite and i will talk a little bit about that later on that means that it's a satellite that orbits the earth around 800 kilometers of altitude and therefore it's capable of observing everywhere in the planet, but only one time per day. Uh, so with satellites, we can have these dense observations that allow us to see how things look in a regional or even in a global scale. This is from the same instrument, but instead of looking just at a, at a, a region, we are looking at the global, you know, at the whole planet. And, and then you can see that so it's something with nitrogen dioxide, we can pick up like cities and we can even pick up also regions where there is important air mass burning or where industrial production is very strong. You can even see here that we see like the emissions associated with shipping lanes, you know, uh, the big mar maritime uh, corridors can be picked. So, that's the strength of uh, their space remote based remote sensing is that you get a full picture of the whole planet. And uh, because it's only one instrument, it's kind of self calibrated. It, you don't, once you understand how the instrument works, it's going to be working the same way everywhere. And you can, it's, it makes it easier to interpret their observations. But as I mentioned, this instrument, Tropomi, which is the state-of-the-art uh, uh, air quality sensor now in low Earth orbit, can only measure once per day. And that's where sensors like TEMPO uh, come to the rescue. TEMPO is an instrument like Tropomi, but instead of putting it in a low Earth orbit, we put it in a geostationary orbit, uh, meaning that it is at around 36,000 kilometers high. 
and it rotates the Earth at the same speed that the Earth rotates. So we are continually looking at the same place. So we can kind of take a picture every hour. Um, there is three of these instruments uh, planned or working. So James is a, a Korean instrument that looks over Asia, and this one has been active uh, for quite a while. And some of the data is publicly available. You can get it from the Korean website, but I guess that will be not so relevant. Tempo, which is the one I work on, um, was launched uh, in April last year, and we've been measuring since August. And you can get access to Tempo data uh, from the NASA archive. Uh, it's quite, I will say it's quite simple, and actually there's a big effort in the community to try to provide all these images and the data in ways that is not overwhelming because as you can imagine, the amount of data these satellites produce is, is large. So if you just want to look at the at what tempo is over your neighborhood or city, it, you don't need to download the hundreds of gigas we produce every day. So NASA has tools um, that help you to uh, subset temporarily and spatially the data you want to get. And then sometime next year, I hope so, the Sentinel-4 will be launched by the European Space Agency to monitor over uh, Europe and North Africa. There is a couple of efforts to try to fund satellites that will be looking at South America, Africa and the Middle East, but that's still an ongoing effort. And it's in its early stages. But if we consider that the most of the land mass is in the, you know, where we have the great largest uh, forests are around the equator and, you know, Africa is going to become one of, if not the most populated continent with a ton of mega cities and South America with the Amazon forest. There's a pity that we don't have anything there like Tempo. However, we still have this. Uh, other low Earth orbit satellites, like uh, I mentioned, Tropomi and NOAA has OMS and others that still provide us like that daily picture once per day of what is going on in the South. And before finishing, uh, I am going to brag a bit about Tempo, just because I work on it. This animation shows the first light. This is what we measure when we turn on the instrument in August. Uh, 2023, uh, and we were we were very pleased. Yeah, when we first looked at it, we were able to pick up the the cities, and we could see how uh, pollution was changing during the day. Uh, how trans we could see the rush hour, and then how things come down, and then the evening rush hour again. So, in this uh, link, you can see. This is the website of Tempo. This is like a one stop where you can get plenty of information about the instrument. And depending what is what your, is your interest, you can get more information about how to get the data. So depending if you want to just have a visualization or look at uh, the data in more the depth, you can go, for example, for the scientist website and and I will recommend you use this uh, ASDC, which is a NASA distribution center, to to get uh, to get to data tempo data. If you want to download, you know, as I was saying, with subsetting and stuff like that. But they also provide links to other uh, tools that are for visualization. And uh, I find this website very useful. And here you have all the products that we have currently available. I will not go into what each one of these means uh, because maybe it's not the, the right place to do so. And I want to finish with uh, showing a visual visualization tool that was developed by a group, the Cosmic Data Histories Group at the CFA, Center for Astrophysics. I think they did a beautiful job. Um, and if all you want to do is to look at tempo data, this I think works pretty well. 
So you can select here a date, but I will just go with one of these uh, feature dates. And now the data is loading. Uh, once it's loaded, then you can click here and it will start cycling, cycling through the tempo observations. And as you say, you see it changes over uh, every time. And then we can quickly zoom maybe over Texas. So this, this data has not been co-added. This is just one tempo observation at the time. So I don't know how familiar you are with remote sensing, but it is quite impressive to see things changing uh, and having such a strong uh, signal. So we can see highways and corridors and big cities and how things change during the day. So I'm almost done. This is, I only have one more slide to show after I have brag about Tempo and how it is working. And that one is, oh, and, and all I want to say, this is a movie, I'm gonna play it. And while it plays, I will talk over it. This is a, an old movie that was generated with data from Gamma House uh, Office, what, doing what they call the Geos 5. I also, Nature run. So basically, it's a model. This is not observations or measurements. This is a model that takes into consideration some uh, satellite or, or other observations through what we call data simulation. And I mean, the, first, the movie is beautiful. Different colors here indicate different kind of aerosols. So this blue one is the sea salt aerosol, and this is like biogenic secondary organic aerosols, the green ones, and then we have dust in orange. And actually the aerosols kind of track the storm. So it's just, to me, it is pleasant to, to look at. But besides that, the point I want to make is that to have a comprehensive and good understanding of what is going on in the planning the air quality system, we need all the components. I have explained before all these measurements in, in the, on the ground, and also from aircrafts and satellites and using different techniques, each one has its own strength. And then if we put all those, those together, together, they not only help us to understand how we are doing with the regulations and improve our knowledge of the processes that take place, but they can also help us to improve the accuracy of the models by improving the physics and chemistry that we code into them and also by assimilating and data from the observations into the model and by assimilating what i mean is that imagine you want to know the weather or the the, the, the air quality tomorrow uh, in one place you could have a free run that you initialize with a set of emissions and a, and equations that govern the chemistry and the uh, dynamics and the transport, stuff like that. But on top of that, you can say, okay, no, I know we have measurements of this species in these locations and this satellite. So we can put them in the model and force the model to take into consideration that information. And that makes it more uh, accurate. That's what we do with the weather models. And that's what we are aiming to do with the air quality models. And Humans like Tempo that have these dense observations are going to be of paramount importance in this kind of efforts. And with that, I want to finish. And uh, thank you for your attention and for having me. And, and I'm open to answer any questions you may have, uh, if I can. Because as I say, my specialty is remote sensing. And maybe you have a question that I don't know. But in that case, I, maybe all of us, we can, we can get to it. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I am going to go ahead and launch a poll for everyone. So uh, you'll take this poll now and then again at the end of the discussion, if any new ideas come up. Um, while I am launching the poll, I'm going to unmute everyone. So you're welcome to raise your hand or join in on the conversation um, and, and ask any questions that way.
Okay, seeing a few answers rolling in. We've gotten responses from several of you, so I'll go ahead and stop the poll uh, here in a few and uh, in just a few seconds, and I'll I'll show some of those responses, and we can we can start to have a discussion about how that might um, how this data and this information might be useful in your garden. So it looks like at the moment. Um, Four out of uh, the five responses are to share uh, this information with others who work in your ozone garden, as well as uh, with some general visitors. Those are going to be our top responses. Um, but each one of these uh, seems like it, it might be useful uh, for you all. So uh, thanks for taking that poll. You're also welcome to put your questions in the chat if you don't want to unmute, but feel free to join the conversation. I know every time I, I talk to you all the time, I talk to your team all the time, and I feel like every time I learn something new, which is always exciting for me um, here, kind of the ages campaign was way bigger than I um realized of all the different uh, instruments to coming together to help us understand uh, our air quality. I you know I think I've heard about individual campaigns over the time over the years and so it's interesting it was interesting to see all of the different planes and the ground monitors all in kind of once one visualization. Yeah, it was like a it, it, it was like a feast of campaigns last summer. <laughs> there were campaigns everywhere. Uh, what this is, sometimes they, they, they did, a, this time they did a very, a, a large effort to coordinate and to, you know, to work together to, and they are having meetings together. And I, I think that's improving the synergy and, you know, the, the lessons they are learning from it. So it's great for, for us as, you know, for, from the tempo, from the remote sensing point of view, space based remote sensing point of view, it's great to have them because they give us so much information about what works and what doesn't. We've got a, a question in the chat here. Are there any plans to make uh, for the public tempo page show near ozone? Um, I only see uh, NO, NOx. Okay, so I guess by near ozone, we mean ozone close to the surface. Uh, and if that's the case, so the ozone profile product is still in development. Um, we by the body, so Tempo has a very short uh, initial uh, lifetime mission, the lifetime, the mission lifetime is quite short initially, but we hope it will be extended. So the idea is that by the end of this lifetime, which is uh, 2024, 2025, sorry, uh, April or May, we will have already released, maybe in two weeks or three weeks, we will have released, um, weeks, no, sorry, months, we'll release a poson profile using only the UV, ultraviolet observations. That ozone profile will have some information about tropospheric ozone, but will still be missing the very powerful part of tempo, which is the ozone close to the surface or closer to the surface, I will say zero to two kilometers, which needs to combine the ultraviolet and visible observations. So for now, we are focusing on making the ultraviolet part work. And when that's working, maybe later on, uh, we will, maybe not, we will add, a, add the visible, but on a second phase. I cannot give you a timeline for when that will be ready. Uh, this is a complex problem. 
the, 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 the UV only profile, as I say, two, three months more. And it will be distributed like all the other products, also through NASA publicly available. And, yeah, so. and I'll add, as soon as, you know, that data is where Gonzalo and the rest of the Tempo Science team feel comfortable and confident with it, it we'll start working on making it available through the, the Tempo visualization tool, um, as well as all the NASA tools so that we can make it as easy to access as possible. Yeah, Emmy, go ahead. Hi, I feel like I'm uh, 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 monopolizing the conversation here, but as why not, right? Um, I'm Emmy Felker Quinn, and I work with the Park Service, and we do a lot of interpolation from um, ground level air quality monitors. And one thing that we uh, we argue a lot about with those ground level monitors with our colleagues in the Forest Service is whether one ground level monitor can tell you what the ozone is across an entire, entire national park or an entire national forest. And so I think it would be great to, um, to, to talk with, with Park Service and with Forest Service about kind of what tempo is showing about ozone variation kind of across those like very mountainous places or, um, uh, you know, places where the, the, there are multiple different land covers, things like that. Um, I know that's a little outside the realm of, of usual ozone garden area, but I think it, it could be a cool conversation for this group to be part of. Thanks. So may, may I say something about this? Yeah, please. I don't know, I don't know if you are involved with with that or not, but I know that in the early adapters of Tempo, there is some, I don't know if it's the forest service or the park service, someone from one of those two is involved and interested in seeing what they can learn from Tempo regarding the problem that you just described. Uh, so if it is you, I apologize for not knowing. Uh, if it's if not you, then maybe it will be interesting to try to uh, make the link. Yeah, I'm more of a plants and dirt person, so I'm not a, an atmospheric chemist, but it, 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 it probably is someone in my office or over at the Forest Service who is involved. I'm glad to hear that's happening though. Thanks. With what you mentioned there, Emmy, I wish Margaret uh, Pippin, who is part of this community as well, was on because she's some done some really interesting work with um, students over the years uh, preparing for Tempo to um, better understand that variability within communities. Uh, she lives um, in coastal Virginia uh, near Norfolk and the the variability near the coast and inland, inland um, you know, they within miles had such different ozone uh, levels. So I think Tempo's ability to see that in places that maybe we don't have all those monitors will be really, is really exciting. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, if there, I have a personal question um, as well that I'm curious about. Um, uh, Dr. Gonzalez Abad, could you speak to how Tempo measures uh, the uh, the chemicals or the molecules in the air? Does it use radio waves, lidar? I'd just be curious to know to know how it's making those measurements and and detecting the quantities. It uses ultraviolet and visible solar sunlight. If I can share my screen one second, I had this slide in the backup. Do you see it? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. So it's not exactly it's not exactly this uh, 
spec these spectra are not from tempo these are from uh, from um, com which is uh, maybe the is the grandparent of all these instruments yeah it's the first one that did this hyper spectral observation but these two boxes here with the dashed lines mark the areas that tempo measures so what we look at is a uh, backscatter solar light from around 290 nanometers to 490 and then from 540 nanometers to 740 and then all these wiggles that you see here are the gas uh, absorption features or uh, there is also scattering <clears throat> properties of aerosols that we can measure and that's where we extract the information from does that answer your question in a very quick way Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I was I was curious, and thanks for expanding on on that a little further. Any other questions? Can I ask? Are you seeing anything exciting or unusual in the tempo ozone stuff that that you kind of didn't expect, or? If I have to be honest with you, I don't look at ozone. <laughs> I'm not the one looking at the ozone uh, retrievals. Um, we are still at the phase of trying just to get the, you know, the bigger, the bigger synoptic pictures good enough. So we have not started to look in detail at regions or specific areas as we have done with Nox or even with formaldehyde, where we have seen interesting stuff, which makes me think that we will see it also with ozone. But the retrieval still needs more work. We are not there yet. Sorry. Uh, oh, actually, one yeah. thing, because you did just mention, right, your your specialty is formaldehyde. And I think one thing that is could be really interesting to this group is how Tempo is going to help us better understand how formaldehyde, NO2, and ozone like the cycle of ozone, um, that might be yeah. something really interesting for this group. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's I, I don't know, are you, I guess the group is familiar with the different chemical regimes of ozone production, but if not in a very fast way, there is areas that are NOx dominated and there is areas that are VOC dominated. And by dominated, what I mean is that which of these, um, okay, sorry, one step back. What I mean by BOC, I mean volatile organic compounds, of which formal, formaldehyde is one of them, uh, which it could be emitted as a primary, you know, it can be emitted directly or be the effect of the uh, reactions in the atmosphere of other BOCs that result in formaldehyde. So we can use it to, to trace these elements. And the formation of ozone in the troposphere is linked to the presence of these uh, precursors. Nitrogen dioxide, for example, is one, and it helps us to monitor and measure, and Tempo can measure that and helps us to monitor these nitrogen compounds that play a role in the ozone formation. And formaldehyde is another one, and it's a VOC, and measure, Tempo measures that and helps us to monitor the presence of these other family of precursors. So combining both of them, uh, we can examine which areas are depending on, you know, in which regime they are and, and try to understand with tempo data uh, what we will expect of the ocean production or in a particular region. And we will see, you know, places where there is, uh, you know, a, a policy that tries to control emissions from cars that then well, no, non-electric cars <laughs> that then permit NOx, uh, they will, you know, help us control the issue if there is an issue with ozone. And in which areas it will not? In which areas it will be better to try to work doing something about the VOCs? Is that yeah? So yeah, Tempo will play a big role on that. In many other aspects as well, it will it, it will also help to probably directly evaluate the emission inventories we have for NOx, uh, for example, uh, and see how fast we can correct them uh, using 
space observation, something we've not done so much till now. There is some work on that within Leo, but um, so yeah. Sorry, I I just thought I'm maybe I go to wrong. That was great. Thank you. Well, we are right under the top of the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and thank you to Dr. Gonzalez Abad for speaking um, and telling us a little bit more about satellite data and tempo. Really appreciate your presentation and discussion today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Have a nice day. Take care, everyone.